everybody. Welcome. My name is Marion Fouquet, and I am Director of Social Science Matrix, and I am truly delighted to welcome you to today's event, not only because I expect this to be a wonderful conversation, but also because this is our first in-person author meets critics in a very, very long time. So today's panel uh, will discuss Martha Wilford's book, Pre-Colonial Legacies in, uh, in Post-Colonial Politics, Representation and Redistribution in Decentralized West Africa. The book explores how normative and institutional legacies from pre-colonial kingdoms in West Africa shape contemporary approaches to redistribution within local states and communities. Today's event is part of our Author Meets Critics series, which features critically engaged conversations about recent books by faculty and alumni in UC Berkeley's social science division. As always, I will begin by mentioning a few upcoming events. On April 4th, we will have a California Spotline online panel on the social and economic impacts of fire, a topic of concern to us all. On April 14th, we have a Matrix on Point online panel on the future of money, mobile money, social media, and cashless economies. And we will host two Author Meets Critics panels in, uh, on two just published books by Berkeley faculty in April. The first one uh, will feature a discussion of Professor Sarah Vaughan's book, Engineering Vulnerability in Pursuit of Climate Adaptation. And the second one will be a conversation around Professor Caroline Chen's book, Work, Pray, Code, When Work Becomes Religion in Silicon Valley. Many more exciting events can be found on the Matrix website, and you can sign up for our newsletter. So now, without further ado, let me uh, introduce our moderator, Leo Ariola. Leonardo Ariola is Associate Professor of Political Science and the Associate Dean of Social Sciences at UC Berkeley. He studies the challenges associated with representation and governance in multi-ethnic societies. His research examines inter-ethnic political cooperation, party competition under ethnic polarization, and political violence in divided societies. His award-winning research has been published in outlets such as the American Journal of Political Science, Comparative Political Studies, and Journal of Politics, along with books published by Cambridge University Press and Oxford University Press. His work has been funded by grants from the National Science Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the US Department of Defense, the Guggenheim Foundation, and Evidence in Governance and Politics. So thank you so much for being here, everyone, and to our panelists. And I leave the floor to Leo. Great. Thank you, Marion. And, um, and thank you to, to Matrix for hosting today's event. Um, and now it's my turn to introduce everyone to the real stars of today's program. Um, we're especially delighted uh, to showcase a new piece of scholarship that contributes to one of the most important and enduring questions in the social sciences, namely how government and society interact to affect patterns of economic well being. My colleague Martha Wilfart's new book, Pre Colonial Legacies and Post Colonial Politics, addresses this question by providing a compelling theoretical argument and an impressive array of empirical evidence. So that we can all learn more about her new book, let me now formally introduce Martha and the two panelists who will engage with her work, Scott Strauss and Alberto Diaz Calleros. Martha Wilfart studies African politics and political economy of development with a focus on historical legacies, redistributive politics, and state society relations. Her current research interests revolve around two themes. The first focuses on historical legacies in contemporary African politics with an interest in the persistence of social norms and the role of concept formation in the historical Renaissance. Work from this first area of focus has been published in Comparative Politics, the Quarterly Journal of Political Science, World Development, and World Politics, as well as Cambridge University Press, which just released her book, Pre-Colonial Legacies in Post-Colonial Politics. A second ongoing stream of research studies of politics of field research in the Global South. Scott Strauss is a professor of political science who studies political violence, genocide, human rights, and post-conflict politics with an empirical focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. He is the author or editor of nine books, including Making and Unmaking Nations, War, Leadership, and Genocide in Modern Africa, and The Order of Genocide, Race, Power, and War, 
which have won numerous book awards. Strauss has published articles in American Journal of Political Science, World Politics, Politics and Society, Foreign Affairs, and other journals. He also serves as the co-editor of the Paris-based journal Violence, an international journal, and of Critical Human Rights, a book series. He has received fellowships from the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, and the United States. States Institute of Peace. In 2016, President Obama appointed him to the Council of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Prior to his academic career, he was a freelance journalist based in Nairobi, and he was nominated for a Pulitzer for his 1996 coverage of the war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Alberto Diaz Calleros is senior fellow at the Center on Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law and director of the Center for Latin American Studies at Stanford. He joined Stanford in 2013 after serving for five years as the director of the Center for US-Mexico Studies at the University of California, San Diego. His work has focused on federalism, poverty and violence in Latin America and Mexico in particular, with more recent work addressing crime and violence, youth at risk and police professionalization. He has published widely in Spanish and English. His book, Federalism, Fiscal Authority, and Centralization in Latin America was published by Cambridge University Press in 2007. His latest book is The Political Logic of Poverty Relief, Electoral Strategies and Social Policy in Mexico. And with that, let me turn it over now to Martha. So I wanna um, thank Marianne and the Matrix for organizing this event uh, and Sarah Lee in particular for a, a lot of her work in sort of shepherding this along um, in the early stages. And I also of course wanna thank Scott and Alberto for generously taking the time to read the manuscript um, and provide, be joining us here today. So today I'm gonna focus, is this not on, sorry. Okay. Um, today I'm going to focus on explaining sort of the core puzzle of that sort of animated this book project. I'm going to then present sort of the broad overview of the theory. I'm only going to sort of situate it schematically in sort of the research design um, and the empirics, and I'm obviously happy to talk about that. But instead I'm going to focus time at the end and sort of drawing out what I see as the big implications of the book for the study of African politics, as well as our understandings of local governance and historical legacies more broadly. So I'm gonna to start today with what Leo would call the classic tale of two cities opener. Um, and I'm gonna um, talk about two contrasting answers I received from two former local mayors in rural Senegal um, in response to the same question. So in 2017, I asked both of these men what they were most proud of having accomplished during their two terms in office. The first mayor who's seen on the left told me that he was proudest of having helped all of his community and that he sort of said, you know, a, you know, a good leader should not put politics before development. Oops, sorry. Um, and he stated that, um, you know, when he was first elected, the first act he had taken upon assuming office was to repair a well in a village that had not voted for him, and that he didn't expect to vote for him in the park in the future. I didn't want to create any problems, he explained, and he thought that by taking an action that could be viewed as decisive or, or divisive, right, that this would sort of send a message that was contrary to what, you know, he really wanted to be seen as, which is sort of a consensus builder and sort of, a, you know, a representative for all of the villages in his local government. And so as a result, he'd invested in some place that had not voted for him. In contrast, the second mayor located about 200 kilometers to the southeast reported that he was proudest of having brought water to his own village as well as his neighbor, the neighboring village, which was the village of his extended family, as well as for having built this health facility that you can see on the right. So a health facility like this is a really um, perhaps one of the most significant investments that Senegal's local governments will make, certainly probably one of a few big investments that a politician would make in a five year term. And while it was true that the local mayor's um, uh, got village had in fact faced 10 kilometers to the nearest health facility when he assumed office, that distance was pretty similar across most of the villages in the local state, meaning that his village was just one of many possible options for him to invest in with, a, with infrastructure of this kind. Importantly, whereas the first mayor told me that no one in his local government would tell me that he hadn't done something to help you know, them or someone in the village, which was in fact true, in the second mayor's local government, people were still quite incensed over this choice, right? And many people thought that there was a better place to put the health clinic 
not surprisingly, often closer, often in closer proximity to themselves or, or their own villages. So whatever we want to make of that contention and that form of critique, what we can say is that at the end of the second mayor's 12 years in office, his village had seen repeated investments from the local state, while other equally large and equally sort of under poorly served villages had received next to nothing, right? So there did appear to be some inequality in the nature of what was being provided. So my book is interested in making sense of these two diverse types of approaches to local governments, governance that's represented in the two mayors. And I would like to flag that these decisions are being made at a particularly important time for basic social service delivery in rural Senegal and across rural Africa um, in general. So Senegal's local governments are responsible for, among other things, delivering basic primary schools and maintaining primary school facilities. And the decade that decades that I'm studying, sort of 2000s to approximately the mid 2015, 2010s, right, saw you know remarkable expansion in in these domains. So, for example, um, in if in 50, you know 2000, 55 percent of um, eligible children were enrolled in primary school. By the end of the decade, that number was close to 80 percent, all while closing the gender gap in primary school attendance. So I'm interested then in explaining why some local governments engage these types of broad based strategies, right, while other local governments remain sort of mired down and sort of a, a perhaps more divisive um, and certainly more contentious form of redistribution. So the first mayor's answer to my sort of question that he was proudest of helping all of his community is out of sync with political science's dominant expectations for distributive politics. Most of our default hypotheses focus on the first two of these literatures, right? So first ethnicity has long been seen as a central cleavage in sub-Saharan Africa. And so we might then expect that elites or local political leaders are going to favor their co-ethnics as a means to sort of build up a voting block. Alternatively, we might simply think that sort of more homogenous communities are going to find it, find it easier to sort of organize around and resolve a collective action problem to either, either co-produce or petition for new public services. In contrast, a sort of second stream of literature um, would suggest that sort of following the reintroduction or introduction of multi-party politics, that leaders are very strategically using what resources they have available to sort of build up or shore up, you know, voting blocks, right? And so leaders could then sort of target core or swing voters, for example. Or we might similarly or sort of relatedly just think that in dist or local governments that just have higher levels of electoral competition, that we might just see local governments be spurred into more action, right? Because they expect to sort of face steeper, um, you know, uh, costs of re-election. To this, I'm gonna add a third uh, set of explanations, which is really specific to the context of decentralization that I'm looking at, which is that many people have suggested that decentralization becomes a vehicle by which the central government pursues its own political agendas vis-a-vis -vis the countryside. So in this case, we might simply expect that the local government might disproportionately channel resources to areas that sort of they want to, that they favor or, or woo somehow. And as a result, the performance of various local governments is really ultimately reducible to sort of the object objections of the central state. I find and repeatedly test throughout the book that these explanations can't convincingly explain the variation that I'm looking at. If we think about the first two mayors that I, that I illustrated um, at the opening of this brief presentation, for example, these men exist or sort of are, are um, elected out of local governments that have sort of very approximate ethnic breakdown, about 70% ethnically Wolof with a large Fulani or Pool minority comprising most of the remaining 30%, right? And in the first mayor's case, for example, absolutely no one made any accusation, nor is there any evidence that he in fact did disproportionately target his co-ethnics, right? Similarly, uh, he did sort of as well as more ethnically homogenous, as well as more ethnically diverse local governments. As the sort of his own, the, the, the illustration I opened with suggests, right? It's not clear that he was targeting core swing voters, et cetera. So he was aligned with the central government as were most, both mayors. And they received approximate levels of central government transfers throughout this time period. In contrast, my research in West Africa suggests that local redistributive strategies are shaped by the legacies of the region's pre-colonial political geography. So the first government and the first mayor falls within the borders of the pre-colonial state of Kaior, which is one of many small pre-colonial kingdoms that populated the territory that we now know as Senegal in the centuries before the onset of French colonial rule. I argue that the first mayor reports feeling obligated to distribute goods 
broadly across the community as a result then of where he falls spatially within the country. So recent work in historical political economy, uh, both by economists and political scientists, has similarly identified long-run legacies for the pre-colonial past. This body of work has tended to focus on things like the nature of the chieftaincy structure or various ethnic norms about accountability as key mechanisms linking the pre-colonial past to the present. These dynamics, I, I would suggest, cannot explain the two communities that I opened this illustration with, right? Or, um, or the, the types of variation that I'm, that I'm interested in the book. Among other things, the French colonial state did not treat or um, various chieftaincy structures or pre-colonial states differently, but in fact dismantled the entire upper echelon of chiefs on the onset of colonial rule. And that means that sort of all village chiefs across the country, both in the pre-colonial as well as post-colonial period have faced a sort of very similar set of administrative burdens, right? And to the present chiefs report playing very similar roles across the country. Importantly, the two dominant ethnic groups that these you know, mayors represent, the Wolof majority and a pool minority, were both home to sort of pre-colonial states in the pre-colonial era, but they can also be found in historically a cephalous or stateless area, suggesting that we should divorce the association of ethnicity with centralization itself. So instead, what I suggest can explain this is that an enduring legacy of the pre-colonial past is the nature of robust social institutions, by which I mean group norms of acceptable behavior in the public sphere, that are a legacy of the nature of sort of pre-colonial political organization that we see in these communities. And from this insight, um, I de develop what I am calling a theory of institutional congruence. And I argue that this can better explain behavior like that of the first mayors, because it focuses our attention on the degree of spatial overlap between the jurisdictional boundaries of the local state, which in the case of Senegal were largely determined by the central government and implemented in a very top-down fashion, right? And the nature to which those new administrative boundaries are capturing these pre-existing social institutions that were inherited from the pre-colonial past. In cases where there were pre-colonial states, those social institutions to the present exist across local villages, meaning that local elites at sort of a, a very grassroots level sort of see themselves as bounded by a shared identity that's reinforced by dense social networks among local elites across villages. In contrast, in areas that were historically acephalous or were not home to pre-colonial kingdoms, we still see very similar social institutions at work or similar norms, right? Again, we would find the same ethnic groups in different, um, in both pre-colonial uh, areas that had been home to kingdoms and those that were not, right? But those same social institutions do not stretch across or are not seen as sort of encompassing multiple village. They tend to be very village specific, right? So the result is that we sort of see variation in the spatial overlap between these informal norms and the formal boundaries of sort of decision-making once sort of decentralized local governments are introduced. This means then that in areas that were home to pre-colonial states, we see these broad cross-village social institutions that are netted into new administrative boundaries that generates high institutional congruence and reorients the incentives that local elites face Right? by aligning both their political and social um, reputations into sort of a, a shared space that leads them to engage in broader redistribution across villages. In contrast, in cases that were historically acephalous, social institutions, I said, tend to remain village specific. At times these might be clan or caste or ethnicity specific, but they certainly are fall very far short of sort of being um, encompassing of the, the majority of the local government. And these I would define as low institutional congruence. And in these areas, politics tends to be rivalrous and redistribution tends to be highly targeted among villages, depending on sort of whoever is able to sort of uh, be elected at any given time. I would note that the nature of politics in this second set is highly diverse, right? So I visited local governments where politics is firmly ethnic and I visited local governments where it's highly partisan and I visited local governments where it's all about autochthony claims, right? So there's a fair amount of diversity in what this second set you know, would all encompass. And I don't have specific theoretical predictions about what we would see in any given, given um, area. But there's, a, 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 I mean, I want to be very clear, there's a, there's a lot of very interesting political diversity that I'm sort of lumping into one group here. All right. So I'm going to provide a quick overview of the evidence. So um, 
I um, am just going to do this to sort of situate the theory and the argument in the broader research design. So to begin with, I drew on archival data to begin sort of mapping the location of pre-colonial kingdoms. I'm happy to talk about this. I'm still working on this in a separate um, related project. Um, but there is an actually, despite the map I showed you earlier, there aren't actually good high quality maps about the spatial extent of pre-colonial kingdoms. And once I had done this, I sort of implemented an original sort of highly structured survey interview with over 350 local elites, by which I mean local elected officials, village chiefs, local opinion leaders. They were nested in about 60 local governments spread across the country's pre-colonial political geography and controlling for a variety of other factors like ethnicity, distance to Dakar, the capital, et cetera. It was from this survey that I sort of developed insight into sort of the mechanisms and the nature of the theory. I then compiled a large end data set that um, records the provision of primary schools and basic health facilities for all of Senegal's uh, uh, approximately 14,400 villages. Um, and with that data, I'm able to show that areas that were home to pre-colonial states, in fact, see an increase in a village's likelihood of gaining access to new public goods in the 2000s. I show that they are engaging in distinct patterns of allocation. So using location allocation models and GIS, I can show that they're in fact prioritizing covering more villages versus sort of maximizing attendance um, in villages. And then finally, through a series of placebo shops, a test, I show that this, we don't see similar patterns in central government goods. That this seems to be a distinctly local dynamic. I then return to the archives to extend that data set of village level public goods back to the onset of the colonial era. And at roughly 10 year increments, I show that sort of the impact of pre-colonial centralization is not the result of what is ultimately a colonial legacy, right? but in fact only emerges following democratic decentralization in the mid 1990s. And that in fact, the colonial and sort of post early post-colonial states seem to have their own distinct ambitions vis-a-vis -vis sort of the distribution of goods that in large part have faded over time. I then returned to the field to engage in some small and theory testing using three in-depth case studies where I sort of probed the mechanisms and in particular added some network analysis. These are two of the examples with which I opened the talk. And then I moved back up to a large N uh, data set, data sets to sort of test the generalizability of the argument. And I showed that we see similar patterns in sort of both the redistribution of public goods and in attitudes across decentralized West Africa. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I'm just gonna really quickly go through what I see as three main implications of the argument. So I'm gonna start with implications I see for questions most obviously of decentralization and to pull apart what we might think about as sort of the theories of decentralization that led to sort of massive policy reform in Sub-Saharan Africa and those, that push is still very ongoing and sort of the practice and reality of those, um, those uh, institutional changes. So first, much of the work in political science at least or in perhaps adjacent policy-based fields has really kept the focus of decentralization reforms on the central state itself, right? And very much thinking about how we can encourage the central state to decentralize or perhaps what the incentives of central state actors are vis-a-vis -vis local governments. Very little work in contrast has actually sort of focused on decentralized local government as a political space in and of itself. And I really want to sort of center these local governments um, as sort of interesting arenas that we should pay attention to on their own terms. Once we do this, I suggest that we can see how variation in local government performance is not easily aligned by sort of the types of central state, you know, variables that a lot of the work in political science has focused on, but rather tends to be driven by sort of um, interesting variation in sort of local politics itself. The implication of this is that if local redistribution is driven by local politics, then institutional reforms are sort of short-term tinkering to the nature of institutional structures in decentralization endeavors. Um, sh we should be much more skeptical about their ability to sort of address inequalities or sort of emerging um, concerns we might have about decentralization. And so in this way, I think the project should serve as sort of a cautionary tale about sort of what can be reformed from above, right? Because I think one clear implication is that the nature of these sort of big pushes to do things like decentralize and create a whole new level of governments is very, um, uh, is interacting very strongly with sort of local level dynamics. And I think we can see some of the costs, potential costs of that in these two representative quotes from two uh, chiefs that I interviewed during the sort of first stage of research for this project, which is that we are seeing in many ways a bifurcated response to sort of the onset of decentralization. So whereas villages 
in areas that were home to pre-colonial states tend to sort of see themselves as part of a shared project at the local level. At the extreme, villages and areas that are historically acephalous are often sort of disengaging or um, really viewing themselves as being treated unequally by the local state. To be fair, at times this is more or less tractable in empirical data, and at other times this is more as just a sentiment that exists based on sort of um, perhaps symbolic slights, which I think are still important, right? But that we should be very concerned at the sort of extent to which in some areas of the country, local government is really being seen as sort of an exclusionary space that's not welcoming or representative of all, of all citizens. We can think of this most directly as being, you know, having costs for sort of people's enroll, you know, having access, close access to send their children to primary school. But there's a number of things that local governments provide, including, you know, things like the Letat Studio paperwork that has implications for people's ability to do things like even receive a voting card or a birth certificate that are necessary for a host of things that they might need. The second area where I think that there's some very clear implications, and I think here I'm in particular speaking to sort of recent work in African politics, is in the nature of political identities that we prioritize in the study of, um, again, Africa in particular. So I think the core insight is that national level political identities, that things that might be very salient cleavages nationally, are in fact rarely, in my findings, the sort of most important identities at the local level. Um, certainly, this, I'm not saying ethnicity and, and partisanship don't matter. People across rural Senegal have ethnic and partisan identities that, that are important to them, right? But that we tend to see far more localized understandings animate sort of the, the, the how people conceptualize the local states uh, local governments that they're now part of. So what this would suggest then is that if we go in only looking for sort of these pre-identified political identities, we might miss very important forms of social identification that are very important for individuals um, and how they sort of think about their incentives and their relationships to other people in their local communities. I think the related methodological point then is that we should be very attentive to the local political narratives that respondents themselves invoke. And again, I think this implies that we should give people space to articulate their own understandings of their communities and the boundaries of those communities. Right? So I think understanding these narratives helps us understand um, uh, again, people's identities. But I think even if we sort of recognize that some of the stories that I have been told ad nauseum are, you know, mythologized histories of an area's local past, even if those narratives stray from the truth, I think the act of telling and retelling them valorizes those identities, right? And the rights and obligations that those identities are associated with for local actors. So in this way, I think the construction and reconstruction of these narratives over time is a very political act that we should be very attentive to. The last point I'm going to make is related to sort of recent work. I'm sorry, the, I think the switch from Mac to BC has, has hidden the text a bit here. Um, is, is to is some implications for some recent work in the historical political economy. So the first point that I want to make here is that I think historical, we haven't necessarily always done a good job in this literature of recognizing the ways in which historical legacies are conditioned by subsequent institutional reforms, right? I think this project really emphasized the interactive nature between formal institutions on the one hand and informal social institutions on the other. And that by examining when the pre-colonial past matters, I hope that my findings serve as a reminder that institutions inherited from the past are political creatures and that they're amenable to repurposing and reinvention sort of under sort of new um, institutional arrangements. I think this can then help us understand how we can have identities that are socially relevant, but politically latent for a long period of time, but that are then repurposed and redeployed under sort of a new institutional setting like decentralization and become, you know, politically activated in a pretty short time period. As a last word, I think a lot of work in historical political economy can feel quite deterministic. And I think this is something I worry about with this book that it might feel overly deterministic um, by sort of relegating communities to sort of good or bad equilibria. Many historical legacies, I want to suggest, can be very productively studied in the present. And I think that if we sort of take some of these historical questions to the field, we might start to sort of understand how those equilibrium are really comprised of really active ongoing social processes. And that in doing so, we can start to see the ways in which some of those dynamics might be more fragile than sort of just abstract models might suggest to us. So to the extent that my argument rests on the idea that there are really 
dominant, you know, shared identities and social ties in some communities that are sort of creating a very distinct broad-based form of representation and redistribution, right? I think we can start to see how shifts in either those identities or those social ties might actually be quite vulnerable to, you know, really um, ongoing generational or, you know, developmental changes as we sort of see communication and sort of education and all sorts of things really accelerate in the pace of change in the rural countryside. Um, I'll stop there um, and turn it over to our panelists. Great. Thank you, Martha, for the overview. And now uh, let me invite Scott Strauss to provide his um, comments. Great. Well, thanks to the organizers for including me. And I fear I'm going to be sort of fail in my task in the sense that I should be uh, titled as author meets fans rather than author meets <laughs> critics, because um, I think this is uh, this is a really outstanding book in a lot of different ways. I think that the central arguments in the books are in the book is are sort of strikingly original, careful, and precise. Um, the data collection is really creative and impressive. The writing is clear and well organized. The research is is sort of deeply anchored in the literature. And the book has a number of very significant theoretical uh, implications that Martha just uh, detailed, and I'll elaborate on in just a second. I also think the book is a sort of model of multi-method comparative politics, social science research. I think the, the insights from which it originally develops and then the actual research design and interpretation of those design comes out of a deep knowledge of place. Um, that is that you cannot either come up with the insights that, that ground this book or the research which builds on, I think, really creative um, indicators and measurements and, and ideas without having spent some very serious time doing research in Senegal and about Senegal. And so these, all of the measures in this book are not off the shelf data sets that you can just download somewhere. They are the, the fruit of very serious work and they're the fruit of really impressive triangulation. That is, you're looking here at an original survey, at historical archival data, um, at a, a sort of network analysis, case studies. I'll actually get into this a little bit later, but I think it's, it's, um, it's really quite amazing, the, the data collection, all of which is on top of like fundamental questions of social science, right? Is what is the effect of history on contemporary politics? How and why does decentralization work well in some places and not in others? what counts as community and how does the state serve a community? What is, what is a community of obligation um, uh, and, and so forth. So I'm gonna divide my comments into sort of four parts. Uh, one on theory, which I think I'll summarize in the interest because of what Martha just said. Second on theoretical implications, which will um, I think repeat a little bit of what Martha said. Uh, third is on the empirics, and the fourth, I'll talk. I'll sort of raise a couple questions uh, in my critics uh, in my critics hat. Um, so, you know, why do government? I think the central question or, or puzzle in the book is, you know, why do local governments engage in different redistribution patterns uh, of public goods, despite being in the same state? And despite uh, in a sort of for, in an equally formal decentralized system, and of course it's a big question, one that speaks to fundamental questions in the political economy of development literature, and also one that really engages with longstanding concerns around governance, a clientelism, and the politics of who gets what in sub-Saharan Africa and other and other developing uh, spaces. Um, and I think the central answer, and here I'm repeating what Martha said, is that redistribution is more equal and more representative where there is institutional congruence between pre-colonial state boundaries and post-colonial local government districts, right? That the pre-colonial states created communities of obligation, what Martha calls social institutions that created norms of reciprocity and norms of appropriate behavior, as well as sanctions for diverting from those norms. Uh, there's a sense of what Martha calls in the book shared fate uh, in those areas. These social institutions persisted over time because they carried real rewards and real costs at the local level, and therefore they fed into social strategies that elites used to maintain their own power and privilege. So they are sort of norms rooted in identity and narrative, but ones that carry with them real interests and expectations. So when local government overlaps with, is congruent with these older political entities, and the communities of obligations that they created, then government is more responsive, fairer, less conflictual, and more equal in its distribution 
than the alternative. And I think that's a really, really neat argument. It's a very specific argument about how local government works um, and so forth. Uh, it's also an argument that is not about sort of center uh, periphery or center local um, politics. It's a, it's a story about local government and how it works. So Senegal and West Africa is the setting, and it's a really interesting choice, a really, I think, a good case selection in the sense that there's been decentralization. Uh, it's been controversial decentralization. Uh, there's also variation in the independent variable of choice in the sense that some parts of the country had uh, these pre-colonial, uh, centralized pre-colonial states and other parts did not. They had what Martha calls, or sometimes literature calls, acephalous states or more horizontal networks rather than centralized pre-colonial kingdoms or other forms of state entities. Um, and also Senegal is a place where you can answer these questions in part due to Martha's expertise uh, and, in, and in part due to the possibility of data collection in these, in these settings. So and there's much more to say about the theory, but let me leave it there in the interest of time. So I think there are some really significant theoretical implications. So um, one is the question of history in Africa. And, and I think most political science to say nothing of popular history just simply does not do a good job of looking at the legacies of pre-colonial Africa on contemporary politics. Um, I think, I, I don't know this literature as well as Martha does, but from an outside perspective, I would say that to the extent that there's a discussion of historical legacies, it really focuses on the effects of the transatlantic slave trade and of course colonialism in terms of uh, shaping um, uh, contemporary Africa, but I think not so much on the pre-colonial African states as such. Um, and yet when you're in parts of West Africa, you're in parts of Southern Africa, you're in parts of Central Africa, you realize really quickly, as I think Martha did, that like these pre-colonial states are really important in terms of people's consciousness and people's political imaginations. Um, and so I think bringing in pre-colonial states into the discussion of how history matters in Africa, I think is a really neat and important uh, contribution. There's a second argument here about states in Africa, and there's a, a sort of longstanding, you know, one of the earliest literatures in African politics has to do with state formation and the problem that most post most colonial states and then post colonial states are these sort of artificial creations that were really the product of European imperial rivalries and controversies and the effects of of explorers and their what they did, and I won't get into all of that. But I think one of the arguments has been that the sort of persistence of weak states in Africa has in part is in part due to the artificial boundaries that were created, that they divided communities in half and so forth. Now that that sort of argument has been countered by the idea that all states in some ways are artificial, right? And so that over time you would think that there would be convergence around um, around the acceptance of state boundaries and the nationalism that they should produce. I think that this book actually has really quite significant implications for this debate. And it suggests to me that the artificiality issue is actually quite real, right? Because what Martha is ultimately detailing here is the long-term persistence of senses of what communities are and how they work and what their implications are for the ways in which states operate. And this, in her, in her work, it's in local government, but I think there's some implications for thinking about national states and um, what kinds of communities they serve. And there's a third set of implications around decentralization and public goods provision. And I think Martha has, has, has already indicated this. And of course, decentralization has been a huge initiative, policy initiative across the continent and other parts of uh, other parts of the world as well. And I think the record has been decidedly mixed. Um, that is, you see in some places, and the theory was that you know by bringing states closer to populations, it would make them more accountable, more representative, and more responsive. But that's not been the. It's been the case in some places, but not in other cases. Um, and I think what's great about this book is it gives us an answer to why that variation exists. And it's not necessarily, again, my field, there may be other answers out there, but to an outsider looking at the sort of politics of decentralization, I think here we have a, a really concrete answer to explaining variation in, in uh, decentralization. There's a fourth implication, I think, about how, how narratives and identities matter, and this also was signaled by Martha, and um, I think this book really sort of challenges the assumption that, sort of, that, that ethnicity drives a lot or most of politics in Sub-Saharan Africa, and that ethnicity is what creates uh, communities of obligation and communities, communities in general. Um, and I think in, in this account, in this book, it's, it's pre-colonial states 
and the communities that they created that matter, not necessarily identity. And through the research design, there's a lot of leverage on this question. And I think that's a really interesting argument. Um, I think there's also a related argument here about the ways that communities are made. And in the book, an, uh, uh, an underlining of the importance of narratives, that is the ways in which people talk about who they are, from where they come and who they are related to and um, what's appropriate within, within those communities. And I work on a totally different topic. I work on violence and I work on how sort of states, you know, how communities are unmade through violence, right? But I too came to the conclusion in a recent book that narratives about community profoundly shape how political elites respond in times of emergency, in times of military emergency with the strategies of violence that they select. And so I think there's really good stuff in here about how ideas matter and how narratives matter in terms of shaping politics, which is not a, which is I think not a common argument in the political economy literature, which is much more focused on interests and utility maximization. So I think there's good stuff there. Then lastly, I think there's um, some good, really good arguments here about uh, the ways that historical legacies matter. And in particular, um, the ways in which they can be variation in when they matter, right? That there's a really subtle argument that it's, it's only in the context of decentralization that these old political communities resurge as being important. And in one of the chapters, one of the interior chapters, Martha sort of is able to show that like under colonialism and the first part of the post-colonial state, these old political identities and communities don't, didn't have much of an effect on public goods provision. It's only in the context of decentralization, which suggests that it's, you know, it's when there are only certain times or there's variation across time in when these historical legacies matter. And I think that's a really clever argument in this literature on, on historical legacies. I feel I'm running out of time. I just wanna say that the empirics are awesome. They are creative, they are rooted, they are deep, they are triangulated. There's just a lot of really good stuff here. Um, I was really impressed with the case studies, which were very carefully designed and, um, and selected. They included network analysis. The historical analysis is, is amazing. Um, the sur there's an original survey. Like, I just think there's some, a lot of really smart choices about measures that come out of deep knowledge of place. I think showing to me the best of area study knowledge combined with modern social science methods. And I think just a great example of, um, of comparative politics. Okay, um, a couple of questions. Um, and uh, so one, um, and I think they, in a way they all boil down to, I think the question of scope conditions and the question of generaliz generalizability beyond West Africa. Um, so one of, one of the questions that, that occurred to me as I thought about this book and the arguments in it is how much of the action is about the, the type or the content of the pre-colonial states? That is what kinds of states they were as opposed to the fact that they existed. Um, and so I think that in this book, there's a tendency to treat the pre-colonial states in a pretty positive way as sources of community, as sources of integration. Um, but not all pre-colonial African states were that way. They were not all uh, sites, I think, of, uh, of positive integration and community. Um, some were very, very hierarchical, extremely exploitative, where caste and status were extremely important with very serious winners and losers within the pre-colonial state, including areas that had quite a bit of, of slavery. The area that I did my dissertation work on is Central Africa and the Great Lakes region. And the states there are, they don't look the way that the West African states do. And so um, the, the kinds of communities that were bequeathed by the pre-colonial states in the Great Lakes seem to me quite different than the kinds of communities that were bequeathed by the West African states. And so the question is like, how much of this is about the content of these states versus the fact that there's congruence between their pre-colonial existence and the post-colonial decentralization. The second issue has to do with the fact that pre-colonial states, I think as Martha knows quite well, were not static. Um, there were periods of expansion, of contraction and conquest. And so the boundaries really shifted quite a bit over time. And in the book, I think I may have misread this, but I think that there was a kind of cutoff 
uh, at the point of colonial expansion, so in the late 19th century. Um, and yet I, the logic of the argument would suggest that these pre-pre-colonial states uh, also would bequeath senses of community over time. That is the 15th century or 16th century or 17th century state that might have disappeared when colonialism um, came into existence um, still should have the same kinds of long run effects uh, if I understand correctly. Um, and so, um, so how do you deal with these states that weren't in existence in the 19th century, but were in existence well in advance. Um, the third question has to do with the place of colonialism. Um, and I think that there is a, a, an implicit claim here that colonialism, colonialism's effects on community were fairly ephemeral. They were pretty superficial. Um, that social, the argument is that social relations from before colonialism persisted through colonialism and then well into the post-colonial state. They were dealing here with sort of 60 years 50, 60 years after independence, and that they're extremely durable. Okay, I'm totally prepared to believe that. Um, but where I get stuck is that in many other places in, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, colonial rule exacerbated resentments, exacerbated local conflicts, where imperial forces picked winners and losers and reinforced power. That created a lot of fissure, a lot of conflict, a lot of imbalance, a lot of inequality. Right, the old adage of divide and conquer is real. Um, and that doesn't seem to be the case here, or I, I, I don't get that feeling here. And I, and I, wondered, I wondered about that. Two more points. Um, uh, then um, I guess one other question that occurred to me, which is, it's not really a fair question, but it's one that occurred to me is, like, what are the policy implications if there wasn't a pre-colonial state, right? I mean, you know, I feel like I feel like some of these communities in um, I think you you preempted this question in some of your comments, but you know some of these communities in in uh, in Senegal, you feel like okay, they have these really strong social institutions, and they're going to do better in a, in the decentralized context, but the other ones don't. So if you're thinking about how do you maximize the effects of decentralization on redistribution and on public goods provision, like what do you do if you don't have these social institutions? Um, and I don't know that that's a fair question because that's not necessarily the job of a social scientist to answer that question. Nonetheless, it's a question that occurred to me. The last question, last point um, has to do with the place of partisanship and kind of contemporary party politics, right? Senegal is a place that is, um, you know, that where there's a lot of really divisive party politics. And that doesn't seem to, that doesn't really, that doesn't show up in the book at all, really. And, and I just, I, I am, pers I'm prepared to believe that, but I was a little skeptical of that. So that I can at least have a, a critical moment. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a great book. Yeah. Those are criticisms from a fan, though. So, that's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Um, so with that, let's turn it over to Alberto. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to come to Berkeley. And uh, thank you, Martha. Thank you, Leo. Uh, thank you. Uh, just the, the fact of being here in person, it's, it's just such a thrill. And, and, and also be with good friends and, and to have, you know, the celebration of your book is, is just incredible. So let me let me tell you a little bit about my thoughts. Um, I, I believe Martha Wilford has written actually a, a beautiful and a remarkable book. And I say this with envy. Um, it's an envy I feel as a scholar who would have wanted to write something similar, uh, but I just did not have her skill or her knowledge or her sensitivity. So I'm in the same camp as you. She has put together in one single volume um, an account that delves into the deep past but she's not thinking in terms of these static determinants uh, that set the path of political development, you know, as a consequence of, let's say, geographic conditions or colonial rule and institutions or ethnic rationalization, like, like the literature, the state of the literature. Uh, you know, most of the current literature does that, uh, but what she does is a true recognition of the political communities that built, that were built by Africans in their own states. So, as I was reading the book, Kayo, I'm sorry if I mispronounced them, but Kayor, Futaturo, Dulov, among others, what she carefully, you know, she looks at them as, as these polities. And then she's very careful about what she calls the acephalous polities because she thinks of them also as political. They're not just acephalous in terms of anarchism or of any kind. But in these ones, uh, they all together constitute what we today call Senegal. But in her account, there is this incredible care 
And let me stop here for a second. The word in English doesn't capture what I want to say. It's not care, it's cura. And, and cura doesn't translate into English easy. It's cure, it's a curator of a collection, of a library, of an old manuscript. It's kumern in German. This, this cura, which exists in other languages, is the way she deals with the people that she's studying. She's looking at politicians, she's looking at bureaucrats, uh, she's looking at citizens a bit less than I would like, uh, past and present with the dignity that is very compelling. And I, I think this is important as a social scientist. She has explored in, in one single book, the role of chiefs who transcend colonial and post-independence administrative jurisdictions and institutions. There's this legacies of chiefs that she looks into. She listens to how these individuals articulate their own role in politics, their own understanding of state authority, including their obligations to citizens. So that's something she spelled out a little bit uh, and, and so it's called. Um, to do this, she has surveyed rural elites to shed light on their idea of what government performance needs, something we also seldom do as political scientists. She reconstructs the social networks of these political actors, um, the way these social ties determine their willingness to serve for the public good. And, and as she's doing this, you know, she's not really looking at these narrow clientelistic interests. Uh, she's thinking about, simultaneously, she spelled that a little bit in her presentation, she's thinking about political boundaries, the territories, the jurisdictions, and how you map them also through time and their permanence. And she has done that actually with archives. Um, then she studies the politics of decentralization and distributive politics, like some of us have done in the past, um, looking at public, public good tradition in two critical things, education and health. She uses state-of-the-art statistical techniques, but she articulates actually a novel understanding of this particular determinants beyond the current hypothesis, let's say, of poor versus swing voters. Uh, she had a slide about this. Um, and in, in a way, what she's doing is she's giving us a new theory of distributive politics in the book. She reports on her field work and how that taught her an enormous amount on the ground. Uh, she talks about this politics of, and I'm sorry, I, I like to talk about the proper names. And I, again, apologize if I mispronounce them. Kebemer, Kongeu, and Kompentu, which are places that she spent. And she gives us a whole chapter on what she learned from, from visiting these places. And they corresponded with her theoretical expectations. And then she moves actually to a bird's view where she assesses these same arguments in the larger West African space with DHS and uh, Afrobarometer data. And she does that in one single book. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just in awe at what she did. Uh, I'm a reader of African political economy. I do not necessarily follow the latest research or scholarship, but I, I see the, the field a little bit marked by some seminal works, which at least have been influential in the way I think about development. So if I think first, my mentor, Robert Bates, my maestro, who, who allowed me to think of political elites in Africa as not these irrational uh, people who are making these wrong developmental policies or institutional choices. There's the important, important work of Jeffrey Herbst, who you know, provides this lucid image of these unique challenges of broadcasting power, but Herbst in some ways is quite wrong. I mean, this is sparsely populated territorial African landscape, we need to remind us, uh, ourselves that we think it's not just geographically or naturally given, you know, uh, Walter Rodney or Mandami will tell us it is something which comes as a consequence of the devastation brought about by colonial rule. Third, and I think this is the biggest imprint in her work, but she doesn't quite say it. I think it's, it's uh, Catherine Boone. And the way it comes through is this account of how power in African independent nations is kind of territorially constructed from both the inherited pieces and fragments of pre-colonial state authority that are connected to these new colonial administrative uh, institutions. And they, in Boone's account, is more of this grantsmanship of how you can, you know, local officials are able to obtain these resources. She, she, she moves that, I think, quite, quite uh, forward. There's, you know, the fourth thing, which might be more the one we lingers in, our, in the back of our heads, which is the work by Leonard Guachenko, the team of, uh, you know, Habariyama, Posner, Humphreys, Weinstein, that have allowed us to think about cohesivity and how this plays out in African electoral processes. That's also Leo's contributions have been on that space, although I think a bit more political than, 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 than that. 
And, and fifth, I would say there's this very important work of Kate Baldwin that allows us to understand that chiefs never say to cease to play prominent roles in, in, in African democratic politics. Now, imagine what she has done. She puts together in one study how all these pieces fit together. She's contributing to a better understanding of comparative politics scholars like myself, much beyond Africa, about how you know, we should bring back these local political identities, these local politics into also narratives of individual political lives of the people who are building these institutions and the political legacies that can be carried by historical processes to our present. Okay, so of course I'm supposed to be a uh, critic. Uh, I, I, I'm not just supposed to praise the work. So I will show you or give you a little bit of my quibbles, but do keep in mind they're coming from a Latin Americanist who has not been in Africa. I have not been in Senegal. Um, I have spent much of my career thinking about problems of state capacity, decentralization, clientelism, traditional governance, public good provision, and more recently I've spent a lot of time thinking about cartographic imagination and how the national states, you know, kind of construct this historical, you know, and, and the legacies of colonialism in, in the case of Mexico. So one thing that happens in the book, which is, you know, maybe subtle, but, but not so, uh, uh, you know, so evident, but I think it's important is that she thinks about time and about how time plays a role. And she, she talks about time discounting. And the way she frames it is that in some ways, politicians are thinking about sort of this longer term beyond elections themselves. But it seems to me that there's something very different that is going on in the book, that in some of the accounts that she actually has about how politicians think about time, it's more almost like the opposite. What's happening is, they're not thinking about the time of an election that is coming in two years. They're actually thinking about time as today, every single moment in these spot markets where they have to you know, show these mutual obligations, at least in the, in the case where there's this congruence. So there's something, there's a tension going on in what, in what she thinks of this very long time horizon as kind of conducive to better good, public good provision, which at the same time seems more like this very short you know, showing, showing once and again that you care about the people on, on, on the present. Uh, there's a second quibble, which maybe resonates with yours, and you were very polite, I think, but violence seems to be mysteriously lacking in much of this account. We don't see a lot of violence in the pre-colonial state formation. We don't see much about rebellion, resistance. All these kinds of things have somewhat disappeared in, in her account. Um, and, and relatedly, and this is probably the more complicated one, uh, the, you know, it's, it's a, I, again, in this audience, maybe I have to remind ourselves, we easily do the shorthand transatlantic slave trade. People in the humanities in other areas would prefer us to speak about enslaved people removed by force, you know, or other ways to, to think about this. But this is something that in her account, it has a role in her trust estimation. She uses Afrobarometer data to explicitly test the, the Wachenko and non hypothesis. But I wonder whether what's going on there is that the hypothesis is just too blunt. The, 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 the data she uses from their metrics uh, does not really capture this dynamic of captors and collaborationists with the colonial regime and who were the victims. And I guess you made me understand a little bit better. It, it, it is also about this pre-colonial states that were probably not very egalitarian, were quite you know, hierarchical and, and quite unfair if you were in kind of the, the caste that was going to be ending up in slavery. So, so I think there's, there's a whole tension there that, that the book kind of uh, glosses a bit over. Um, okay, I'm going a little bit, uh, okay. I, I think I will mention this one. Uh, she does something very interesting, which you know I had not originally thought to talk about, but now that she showed us her maps in, in, the, in the presentation, I, I cannot resist myself. <laughs> but she does this thing where she looks at the, at, the, at the polities, at the seats of power, and then she creates a 20 kilometer buffer around them. That's the way she constructs her maps. And the buffer makes sense. It's because of the way she thinks of distance and, uh, and, and kind of trade and the possibility of broadcasting power over that space. Uh, but in many ways, in, in her book, she's very careful also about thinking there's a very European way to think about boundaries. You know, the maps she showed us up here actually have these boundaries that shows these territories. She doesn't do that. She actually looks at this 
dots, and then she, you know, so it's these points, and then there's there's a hinterland around them. But that's the way the, the polity gets constructed. Um, but it seems to me that there's still something else that I, I do not quite understand how it works. And she mentions it at different moments in the in the book. She talks about the Czech news, which would be the, the seats of administrative power. I do not quite understand the French system enough to know if these are actually the same as the prefectures. Um, but somehow there is something going on there that has to do with the subordination of these other villages that are connected to the central village. And we don't seem to understand how, how this actually works. So, so this is, um, and, 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 and you know, I, I was not going to talk about this one until you show the maps and I thought, okay. <laughs> uh, going back to the maps, there is a peculiar map. Uh, it's the map where she looks at alternative hypotheses. I'm sorry, uh, I didn't write in my notes. It's the first map that we get. Oh no, the second map we get. We get first the map with the, with the circles. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't remember which map it I is. But in this map, she puts the railroads, the railroad line. And again, as someone who doesn't know enough about Africa, I was just struck that in her regressions, we never see distance to the railroad, uh, kind of this network that was extracting people and resources. <laughs> Um, something about geographic isolation, how would that be confounds in, in the integration of these political units into trade networks? So this is a different part of the story that she doesn't really talk about. Maybe when she did survey of the officials of the 350 uh, officials, um, she has some stories out there about trade and about the mobility of people and goods across the territory that I was just you know, missing. Um, there is something peculiar, as much as I say that she brings the voice of, of, of the rural leaders, there's something muted in the voice of the villagers and of the citizens, of the local citizens. She uses DHS, she uses survey data from upper barometer, but we get more of an elite sense of it. Uh, in a way, the way other people have done this is you usually would like to have a mass survey as much as an elite survey, and then look at how they, there is a mismatch on how they understand performance, how they understand corruption, how they understand, you know, different aspects of, of, of public good delivery. And this might just not have been feasible due to limitations of money and, you know, field work, etc. I want to finish by, by mentioning one thing that she does at the very beginning of the, of the book. And she, she talks about milling uh, millet, okay? And, and, and some of you might think that this is strange, you know, why would she start the book with that? Um, uh, and I, I just want to say there's an enormous transcendence to that example. And even though she's talking about 17 mills, this is very similar to, in my country, uh, what it means when a woman is producing a tortilla. Okay. So, so what happens is that when we think about development and the role of women in, in development, uh, the political choices that are made at the level of the provision of public goods had enormous consequences on how some specifically, sometimes some particular or particularly vulnerable groups live their life. So if, if you only have a grinding stone to produce a tortilla uh, in a tiny village, a woman will spend three or four times of her day just doing that, getting the corn, grinding it in order to produce the food that her family, her family will eat. And, and I'm sure that's the kind of reason why she put that at the very beginning of that as an example. So I just want to remind you that this is not then just about distributive politics. It is about very, very essential things that you know are the liberating possibilities, uh, particularly to some um, uh, speci specifically vulnerable groups. So thank you for giving us this talk. Thank, thank you, Alberto. So I think between Scott and Alberto, um, if you had to respond to everything, you'd have to write five more books. Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm, but also because I'm mindful of the time, yeah. I'm going to give you two minutes, Martha. <laughs> no problem. Pick highlights, and then we, we're going to open it up for Q&A. Yeah, um, I mean, thank you so much for these uh, very generous, but also very thoughtful comments on the book. Um, actually very helpful as I sort of, um, I mean, I'm done talking about pre-colonial legacies for the most part, but they're helpful as I think about sort of other, other um, projects moving forward. I'm going to say something really quickly about um, the types of states. So I think it's right that perhaps I present a sanitized portrait of some of these pre-colonial states. I think that's partly a function, though, of the nature of, 
of Senegalese states, which I think are somewhat more settled than in other parts of the continent. So, um, and actually sort of finishing up a data set of all of the continents south of the Sahara states uh, in the 1800s. And so some of the questions you brought up, Scott, are things I really explicitly want to test, right? Or sort of, or thinking about areas that have sort of seen really recent expansion or contraction and sort of um, come up um, with some insights into sort of how the content of states might vary, because I think we haven't really seen that in the literature. So I agree with you that that is a really interesting and pressing question. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to say I have to pick very carefully. Um, I guess I'll jump around a bit. So I think the citizenship question, I completely agree. Um, and I, this was just a function of like needing to stop somewhere and also needing something more, we need more than a single book in my mm -hmm. career, right? Um, but I, um, I completely agree that I think these, are, these voices are missing. And so I, in, in sort of a, a new ongoing project, I'm really interested in sort of toggling back and forth between them because this is something I was unsatisfied with too, is that sort of I am really relying on sort of elite um, narrators to tell me about, um, you know, how, how they view their communities. I mean, you know, anytime you spend a lot of time in areas, you, you do have these sort of like wraparound conversations that are, you know, don't dial IRB consent, right? But when you're talking to people about what, you know, about their communities. And I mean, I think many of those conversations made me feel that there was broader, broader traction to the argument. Um, a lot of these were like with moto or horse cart drivers that we were renting, but, um, but sorry, those are certainly, um, those are voices that are systematically missing. And I, and I do worry that um, in all of the communities I study that sort of certain voices like women or youth or mm -hmm. things like this are sort of um, heard, heard even less. Um, yeah, so um, the main point, I don't know, I've got two minutes already. Um, I can keep going on. No, well, why don't we actually open it up? I suspect there might be folks in the audience who have questions um, or folks who are on Zoom who want to post a question in the Q&A window. Um, I'd be happy to read that for you. So um, who wants, where the floor is open, folks. So if anybody wants to jump in with a question. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. I'm focused on redistribution. I'm interested also in sort of, uh, you know, the, of the expenditure side of the state, also the kind of uh, taxation side of the state and wondering, uh, if there's variation, you know, maybe getting a little bit more in the nature of the social contract within the state of the um, and oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. So just basically wanting to know more about maybe the full fiscal side of the state and um, yeah, what kind of variation there is. Yeah, yeah and that's a great question, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so um, I don't have robust tax data. I tried my best and was unable to extract it from the Ministry of Finance. Um, I did ask in the, the first survey, I would I interviewed all the local government secretaries, so I have like their reported estimates, but I mean, it's really a mushy, like, oh, 70, 80% of the local, ta you know, rural tax. Um, but what I can tell from that is that, you know, there are governments where people say, well, you know, so there's a one local sort of essentially it's a head tax. That's um, what's the, the main sort of fiscal lever of local governments. Um, they have a right to collect other taxes. They almost never do um, unless they have a particularly lucrative market. Um, but so, I mean, there are, there, I think there is a distinction between those that don't tax at all or hardly any, right? And those that are actually taxing at a high rate. Um, so this is in the book, um, I'm forgetting the exact numbers, but so areas that were home to pre-colonial states do tend to tax more, um, again, based on this like small end of admittedly mushy data. Um, in part, that's because some of the historically established areas in the Casamance region don't tax at all, which is a legacy of, of a, a conflict mm -hmm. in there, in that region, um, a sort of low level sort of separatist insurgency at the moment. And so I think that the local governments there have decided like they do not want to touch the local population at all. And so I think once you sort of remove that sort of exceptional population, the, the, the difference of mean tests are sort of less significant, but, um, but it is a difference, right? And I think that to an extent sort of when I ask people about it, like part of it is about like this mobilization um, around sort of a, a shared, you know, sense of, sense of fate. But I, I'll be the first to admit that I, I had wanted better data than I was able to get on that. And I think it's a super interesting question. Um, I think it's, yeah, I mean, I think local taxation, people do pay local taxes. And even if we think of it as not being a lot of money, I mean, that is, you know, extracting it, not extracting, but extracting a dollar or two, you know, out of a very poor household is still a real political act. And I, I think there's tons of room for interesting work there, if anyone can get the data. <laughs> um, go ahead, back here. 
Hi, thank you so much for this um, fascinating study. Um, I'm curious if, about the ways in which uh, people express their um, affinities with post-colonial um, entities, the um, ways in which people uh, express identifications tied to pre-colonial political formations. This comes from someone who's... Uh, uncle is constantly talking about being wallow wallow so <laughs> exactly yeah um, no totally <laughs> people love to talk about it yeah so um it comes in so i mean i should be clear that you know i spent a lot of time with like my research assistants um talking about how, how to not prime people right so we would really just start with really general questions like could you tell us about your village and when it was founded and you know what was here before the french to sort of give people a space to volunteer whatever they wanted um but sometimes it was really explicit so like the opening example the the this mayor you know we arrived and we went to introduce our you know i called ahead of time and arranged all of this but when we went to introduce him it was like welcome to the heart of the coyote and like there really is the sense of pride i think it's again it's especially among elites who can often trace their family lineages to, you know, these tales of illustrious glory um, that I think um, is really prominent, right? And I think people still really keep keep those things alive. Um, I didn't talk about it as much in the presentation, but it's in the book, um, is that, I mean, I think some of this is, is rooted in sort of, you know, local inequalities over right who has like right to land and things like this, right? Because people are tracing all of those, you know, the farm you of the land you farm is related to sort of the family you're from and sort of keeping those those genealogies alive and sort of rooting your genealogy in this like you know illustrious pre-colonial past is a really powerful form of capital for local elites to sort of continue to reinforce their status so um i mean i, I do want to be very cautious about and sort of recognize those hierarchies at the local level too but um yeah it's often just people just really like to talk about, <laughs> about it luckily for me and so i think we have time for one more question did you have a question Um, I had a question on the, what does it mean to be from a pre-colonial state and what is the relationship of all of this to language of our, is language a confounder in this relationship of people who speak the same language or same dialect are more likely and how is that accounted for in this, um, in this analysis? Yeah, um, language is an interesting question. I mean, so most of Senegal's pre-colonial states, and in fact, most of West Africa's pre-colonial states, and I would go as far as to say most pre-colonial states in the continent were like multilingual and multi -ethnic. Right. I mean, there's almost always like an ethnic, one ethnic group that would assure like the elite or that, you know, the monarchy or whatever, whatever system was in place. Um, but so if we think about like the Kaior kingdom or, you know, the Baul or, or you know, the Wallows, I think maybe perhaps more associated with the with the Wolof, but, you know, there were clear Fulani minorities and clear rights to more in Fulani sort of pastoralists within, you know, the Wall of the of what Sarah was talking about or in the Kaior um, with Sarah minorities and things like that. So, I mean, I think that it's, it's hard to say that it's reducible to just language because these would be multi-ethnic spaces in which people would be sort of you know, moving between languages just as they are today. Right. Um, yeah, that's helpful too. Okay, great. So we are at time. Thank you everyone. Join me in thanking Martha and her fan club.